Do you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression? You should come. And come they have like never before. 2017 to 2020, Border Patrol encountered 14 illegal aliens on that watch list. But from 2021 through 2023, that number jumped to 263. It's slowly becoming a bipartisan issue on news. I'm a loyal Democrat, but I am not happy. Here's the problem. We don't feel safe. What is going on in the minds of the social engineers who are creating this crisis on our southern border? It's not just Democrats, it's the, it's the entire global left. First of all, it's very important to understand that the ideologies, and as we say ideologies, because in this case, we're talking about idiots, that the ideologies driving our current border policy, our open border policy, they're not monolithic. There are several different agendas that are at work here. For instance, there are those who, Republicans, conservatives, who desire cheap labor. I was recently bumped into the CEO of a large company, a friend of mine, somebody I've known for maybe 30 years. And I was talking with him a little bit about a project that I was working on and traveling throughout uh, Eastern Europe and South America to investigate the immigration problem from the other side of the borders. And he said, you know, without immigrants, I would be out of business. He said, I'd absolutely be out of business. And he, I, somebody that I used to work for, he said, you know, you were the last of a generation. You know, a guy like you, when you were in your teens and your early 20s, you were willing to unload trucks and drive a, a forklift and drive an 18-wheeler. Believe it or not, I used to drive an 18-wheeler. He said, no more. He said, you know, white kids won't do stuff like that anymore. And he said, without immigrants, I would be out of business. So that's one of the agendas. Hey, this is not a guy who is a, a leftist. He's not a Marxist. He's, he's not a fascist. Uh, he's not a socialist. Uh, quite the contrary. He loves America and he, he's, uh, he's a capitalist. So there's that agenda. There's also a desire to overturn red states. Many Democrats are using immigration and hence the reason that they want to move them around the country into red states so that they can ballot harvest, so that they can cheat in elections, move them into red states, into red cities, and flip those cities and flip those states in favor of Democrats. That is is yet another agenda. And then there are those silly Christians, mostly I would say, or people that I would say, as we, we call them on this show, or as we call the philosophy that they adhere to, they're Christian-ish. They're Christian-ish. They are imbued by a kind of vague belief that it is the responsibility of Americans, of Christians, to open our borders to just about anyone. I've heard a guy by the name of Pastor, by the name of David Platt, you know, speak uh, along these kinds of lines. I've heard guys like Russell Moore speak along these lines. And that, of course, is just simply naive and stupid. Because do you leave the doors to your house open? Do those people leave the doors to their house open? Do they just let anybody in? Well, of course they don't. In the same way, there has to be a sensible border policy. We can't just let anybody into our country. But there are those, the Christian-ish, who think that it is the responsibility of Christians to allow just about anybody across our border. And I say that it's naive and stupid because people like that haven't really given much thought to... <laughs> who or what is coming across our border. They tend to be people who are quite naive about the rest of the world. As I've said on this show many times, I would not allow Muslims into this country. I simply think that uh, um, Trump was right in shutting down flights from Islamic states into this country. And that is because a real Muslim doesn't share our values. Not at all. They have no desire to assimilate. They don't, they don't value the 
the ideas uh, embodied in the Declaration of Independence or in our Constitution. Freedom is not a concept that they understand or appreciate. Indeed, Islam means submission. That is not what they're about. And hence, you just simply, you don't allow people who don't share your worldview, you know, into your club. Well, you can't allow them into your country either. So my point here is that there are several ideologies, ideologies that are at work here when we're talking about the border. They are not monolithic, but... The dominant ideology will co-opt the weaker ones. This has happened throughout history. So, for example, Marxism often co-ops Christianity, and that is because it's very effective at, as I say, sock puppeting Christianity. It can slide up into it among those people who are Christian-ish, who don't really understand the Bible. They don't really understand the doctrines of their espoused faith. They just have Christian-ish ideas of love, of equality, of uh, diversity, of tolerance. All ideas that find resonance in Scripture, but they're rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. They're given context. They're given meaning by Jesus Christ, and they're given meaning by his word. But apart from that, untethered from that, they just simply become feelings rather than principles or values. And so that's the reason why you're seeing the woke church, because you have a lot of people who are graduating from seminaries, seminaries that have been penetrated by Marxist ideology in the name of social justice. Marxism isn't always called Marxism. It often takes it, it is it is an ideology that has the ability to morph as it tumbles down through the decades, unlike any that I've ever seen. And it takes on new names. It takes on new packaging. But it's the same old hateful dogma of Karl Marx that he expressed in the Communist Manifesto. Go read it. Go read the Communist Manifesto. A little book, maybe 90, 100 pages uh, published in 1848, it's um, it's just full of hate. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit more as we talk about the border crisis. So what is the dominant ideology here? Well, it is a Marxist ideology. Those pushing it are not themselves necessarily Marxists. In fact, I would argue that they are fascists as a recent discussion with uh, Federalist CEO Sean Davis, who joined me here on this show, um, shares that particular view with me. I would argue that they're fascist, but they're using tried and true, or false, I should say, Marxist tactics to bring societal disruption. It is a desire to destroy and Marxist tactics are very effective in bringing about societal disruption. So who's behind this? What exactly is going on? Well, I'd like to show you a little a, a snippet of a speech that was given by Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Now, you may be familiar with him because Tucker Carlson went to Hungary and did a series of interviews with Orban. He's become something of a, of a conservative icon, and for good reason, because Orban has sought to protect his own borders. He's, been, he's not been shy in stating that they aim to protect their Christian values. But this is him speaking at CPAC in Texas in 2021. Now, his accent is just a little thick, and on the other side of it, I will, I will try to clarify anything that you might not have understood. But let's listen to what Orban says here in this particular talk. If you separate Western civilization from its Judeo-Christian heritage, the worst things in history happen. Let's be honest. The most evil things in modern history were carried out by people who hated Christianity. Now, now, let me stop right there. So he's saying that we have a global left, a, a European left in this case, who are out to destroy 
Christian values. They're out to destroy Christian values. And that is because they believe that somehow Christianity itself is evil. There are a lot of young people who might listen to this particular show who believe that. I engage them on college campuses. I engage them all the time who buy in to this particular nonsense. And that is because that's what they're being indoctrinated with. When we're talking about these presidents um, recently who created such controversy, rightly so, the presidents at the University of um, Pennsylvania uh, at MIT and at Harvard, all female, all parroting each other anti-Semitic ideas. Here they are talking about, um, well, it's not really anti-Semitism unless you act on it. So being asked very directly, do you condemn on your campuses calls for genocide against the Jews? And they said, well, not until it becomes an act. So not until you actually commit genocide against Jews do these university presidents condemn it. <laughs> these are the kinds of people who are educating our children. And education will become a topic of a future of a future show. I have spent a lot of time on all of those campuses, MIT, Penn, Harvard, Yale, 22 in the um, in the Northeast, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and 18 in the South, stretching from Nashville all the way to and Vanderbilt all the way to D.C. and Georgetown. I've been on uh, all of those campuses, and I can offer you some real insight, I think, into what is going on there. But these are the people who are, who are educating our, our youth and are, are inculcating them, are teaching them these warped ideas that Christianity somehow, which is the basis of Western civilization, it has given us our art, our literature, the rise of science, capitalism, all of it is the result of Christianity. And um, that, that, again, I would just simply point you to somebody like Neil Ferguson, the West and the civil, civilization, the West and the rest. Ferguson, his wife, recently, Ian Hersey Alley, she recently converted to Christianity. He's a historian, Oxford educated, taught it taught at Harvard, uh, now he is at Stanford and he is part of the Hoover Institute, I believe. But he wrote a wonderful book in which here he is as an atheist puzzling over how Christianity gave rise to the West as we know it and Western values. But these values, says the Hungarian prime minister, are being actively assaulted by um, the global left, um, particularly by European and American leftists. So let's continue to hear what Viktor Orban has to say. Don't be afraid to call your enemies by their name. You can't play safe, but they will never show mercy. Consider, for example, George Soros, as you call him here. In Hungary, in Hungary we call him Yuri Bachi which means Uncle Georgie. The wealthiest and one of the most talented Hungarians on earth. Just a hint, be careful with talented Hungarians. Uh, I know George Soros very well. He is my opponent. He believes in none of the things that we do. And he has an army at his service. Money, NGOs, universities, research institutions, and half the bureaucracy in Brussels. Now let me stop him right there for just a moment. So here he is, Viktor Orban, is saying one of the people who is driving this, and as he would say later, I, we're not going to listen to the entire speech, but he's, he'll say later in this speech, driving the immigration policy throughout the West and trying to force it on Hungary. Now, Soros is a Hungarian. Soros himself is a Hungarian, hence the reason he says we, we call him, and obviously he's, he's being quite sarcastic here. The people of Hungary are sarcastic in calling him Uncle Georgie, Uncle George, uh, a Soros, because of his maliciousness. And I love the fact that Orban here is stating very openly what he thinks about Soros. He says he's my opponent, my enemy. 
This is who he is. And George Soros is the enemy of freedom-loving people everywhere. And he says he has an army at his disposal, and he does, of university professors whom he's purchased, essentially. Um, he uh, has NGOs, non-governmental organizations, which he's using. And then he says he, he basically owns half the bureaucracy in Brussels. That's the European Parliament. We continue. He uses this army to force his will on his opponents, like us Hungarians. He thinks that the values dear to all of us led to the horrors of the 20th century. But the case is exactly the opposite. Our values save us from repeating history's mistakes. The horrors of Nazis and communism happened because some Western states in continental Europe abandoned their Christian values. And today's progressives are planning to do the same. They want to give up on Western values and create a new world, a post-Western world. Who is going to stop them if we don't? Orban gets it. He understands that the core, the foundation of Western civilization is Christianity. If you, if you destroy the substructure, you can't keep the superstructure. You can't knock out the foundation and keep everything above it. It doesn't work like that. As I argued both publicly and privately with Christopher Hitchens, my, uh, my late friend, the late atheist and journalist, who would say that he, was, he, he valued freedom, he valued democracy, all of these things that are embodied in our um, Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. I mean, Hitchens himself was a naturalized American citizen. He was British, and he was naturalized, and he wanted to be um, naturalized and was at the Jefferson Memorial. I mean, that, that goes, you, goes to show you how much he was adopting the values of his adopted country. But he didn't understand that it was Christianity that gave us all of them. They want to say that it came to us from the Greeks. It didn't come to us from the Greeks. It came to us from the Hebrews. It came to us from Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is rooted in those ideals. It's rooted in the idea that human beings have intrinsic value, that we are not simply an, a cosmic accident in space and time, that we're not just like any other animal, which is driving the philosophy that is going on here. And so Orban is telling us, he says, look, these people, George Soros in particular, they are godless, and hence the reason they want to destroy Christianity. And he goes on to say, you must understand that fascism and um, socialism, communism, Nazism, they are all driven by fundamentally atheistic views, atheistic beliefs. They're both driven by that. One of them is understood to be a, you know, an expression of the extreme political right, the other of the extreme political left. I would argue they're both expressions of the extreme political left. And they're the logical place you end up when you deny the existence of God. They are atheism masquerading as political philosophy. So who is Soros? Why does the prime minister of Hungary single him out in particular? Well, this is an interesting interview. I, I found this from 60 Minutes, and it's an interview with Steve Croft. It took place in 1998, 1999, and it's just a little clip with Soros. Now, he's not talking about immigration here, but it does give us a little glimpse into the man's soul. So let's, let's listen to this. In the last two years, you've been blamed for financial collapse of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, and Russia. Yeah, all, of the, all of the above. That's, all of the above. Yeah, yeah. Are you that powerful? No, I think there's a great misunderstanding. The Prime Minister of, of Malaysia yes. um, said that the region spent 40 years trying to build up its economy, and along comes a moron like Soros right. with a lot of money, and it's all over. He called you a criminal. 
it's easier for him to blame an outside force. I think that uh, I've been blamed, blamed for everything. I am basically there to, uh, to make money. I cannot and do not look at the social consequences of, of what I do. Do you believe in God? No. Now, it's the last two remarks that I really want to draw your attention to. I, I let the interview run just a little bit longer so that I'm not accused of taking what he said here out of context. So I wanted to give you the full context of his remarks. But he says, first of all, he doesn't look at the social consequences of his actions. Now, that's the behavior of a sociopath. Don't Just don't consider the social ramifications. You have the ability with your money to tip the scales in a particular direction, and you do it, but you give no thought to how it affects other people because you don't care. You just don't care. Now, a lot of people have alleged such things about George Soros, and he has his many defenders in media whom he's bought who defend him with fact checks. We've talked about that before with, um, with Bill Gates, who, by the way, has a lot more money than George Soros. Both are pernicious. But George Soros is the original pernicious guy here. He set out to do evil. He doesn't care what the social consequences are of what he does. And I, I would love to ask, I'm glad he did. I would love to ask Steve Croft. I wish I'd have known when I met Steve Croft uh, some years ago. I wish I had seen this interview and had been able to ask Croft, what, what compelled you to ask him that final question, do you believe in God? I wonder if Steve Croft believes in God. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But Soros answers, honestly, no. Now, if you think that his, his views on God's existence or non-existence are irrelevant to his political philosophy, you would be wrong because one's worldview, how a person answers the question of God's existence or his non-existence, from that, everything else flows. What Mao had in common with Hitler and with Stalin and uh, with every megalomaniac who's committed genocide is atheism is they didn't believe in God. And if they weren't that, then they were believers in Islam, who said that, which says that they have the responsibility to force all non-Muslims to convert, pay a tax, or die. But even Mus the Muslim death toll pales in comparison to that of atheists. Atheistic regimes killed no less than 150 million people in the 20th century alone. That is more than all religious wars from all previous centuries combined. And yet there's still people who want to say that it's Christianity, it's religion that causes all the problems. <laughs> Not so. It's guys like George Soros. And you had a glimpse of the kind of guy that he is, what it is that drives him. He gives no thought or consideration to how his actions affect other people. And why would he? He's an atheist. I mean, he doesn't believe there's a heaven or hell. He doesn't believe there's reward or punishment in the afterlife for his actions in this one. So he figures, I'll just do whatever I want. And I will because I can, because I have billions of dollars. Everyone's going to encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain, and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering. Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do, and undoubtedly some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. 
I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine. And I want to tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. Now, in my view, George Soros is a, um, he's Heath Ledger's joker. He's Heath Ledger's joker. He is an agent of chaos. And with his money, he is purchasing, he is training, he is creating lots of little mini jokers, lots of little mini me's, lots of little mini Soros's. And together, they are an industry of chaos. This is what they're about. This is BLM funded by Soros, Antifa funded by Soros, and loads of other little NGOs Um, that don't bear his name. They don't bear his fingerprint, but he's funding them. Did you know that Human Rights Watch, which is offering a lot of the commentary on what's taking place uh, in the war between Israel and Hamas, Human Rights Watch, which has a name, which makes it sound like they're just neutrals. They're like the Red Cross who is just offering commentary on human rights issue, is funded by George Soros, created apparently by... George Soros. This is the guy that he is. Now, what does this have to do? What does this have to do with what's taking place on the border? Well, it has everything to do with what's taking place on the border because a guy like Soros, he's not simply funding it. He is the embodiment of the Democratic Part, the Democrat Party philosophy of open borders that you are also seeing, if you maybe you're not aware of this, but this has been going on in Europe for a very long time. He, it, it wasn't until Obama that he'd been able to achieve it here. George W. Bush had protected our borders. So had Bill Clinton. But that's not what's happening now. Since, since uh, Obama, it was reversed again with Trump, who closed our borders, and now they're wide open again under uh, the Biden administration. But it had been going on in Europe for decades now. Decades, um, excuse me, Europe has been overrun by um, a horde of immigrants, most of whom are coming out of Islamic states, and hence the reason you're seeing all the terrorism that is taking place. Now, what, what sort of philosophy is driving this. Well, as you might have heard, and and I think it may have been our first podcast, I talked a little bit about this, our very first show, uh, I talked some about this, but George Soros was a student of a man by the name of Karl Popper. Now, Karl Popper said many things that you would agree with. I was planning to put his books here on my uh, on my desk, but I uh, I forgot to do it. <laughs> but George Soros was a student of his at the London School of Economics. Um, Popper was a philosopher, and he's best known for his two volume work, "The Open Society and Its Enemies." Now, what is an open society? What was Popper talking about? Well, again, I would say that there's much that you would probably agree with Popper on. I certainly agree with him on a great many things. But his open his open society philosophy is a um, is a deeply flawed philosophy. Now, let's contextualize it just a little bit. Popper was Austrian. He was there, I believe, when Hitler's uh, Wehrmacht, you know, came goose stepping into Vienna, into his home country, his beloved country. And um, Popper eventually would emigrate to Britain. And as I say, he taught at the London School of Economics for some time. But Popper looked at the world 
and he looked at the 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 two main totalitarian ideologies that then threatened the free world. On the one hand, you had fascism embodied by the Nazis. Now, I will make several references to fascism. It is important that you understand that all Nazis are fascists, but not all fascists are Nazis. Uh, Nazism, by definition, is anti-Semitic, and not all fascists are anti-Semitic. Take uh, Klaus Schwab, for example, the the founder and chairman, the sole chairman of the World Economic Forum. Um, I would argue that and have argued that Schwab is a fascist, but I don't think that he's anti-Semitic. Nothing in his resume would suggest that. In fact, quite the opposite. But Popper looked at that and he said, you know, here is this absolutist fascist ideology which claims to embody the truth. They embody the truth. And they're threatening the free world. <clears throat> Indeed, they're committing a genocide on a vast scale. Then he looked on the other hand and he said, but socialism, communism, the Bolsheviks, the Soviet Union of Stalin, it is also a political ideology that maintains that it embodies absolute truth, not just a truth, not just an interpretation of truth, but the truth. And both fascism, um, Nazism, and, uh, and the socialism, the communists, uh, both claim to be scientific. They claimed that they were rooted in science. Now, have you heard this before? We're seeing this a lot these days. It's a very effective way of removing a discussion from the table. You want to object, and they say, ah, but science. Is the vaccine, oh, but science. I have some real questions about climate, poly but science. Science has been weaponized. And I would say that it's not real science. Real science is not your enemy. But pseudoscience is. And guys like George Soros, I don't know if he's doing it specifically, but they're, say, for instance, guys like Bill Gates, they are funding a lot of scientific research, and they already know what the outcome of that research is going to be because they've paid for a particular outcome. The very worst type of research is beginning with a conclusion and working back from it. In my own research, I begin with, a, with kind of a, a loose thesis. And then I let my research dictate the outcome, the conclusion in which I might, might look back and say, you know, my thesis, my theory was wrong because the evidence doesn't support that. That is not the way these people work. They begin with a conclusion and they work backward from it and they discard any and all evidence which contradicts their a priori assumptions. They reject all evidence that doesn't fit the thesis that the people who are funding them want. That the people who are funding them want. So a guy like Karl Popper, he looks around the world and he says, gosh, it is these absolutist ideologies, what he called historicism, historicism because they claim they could interpret history, not just the past, but the future, the flow of history, where we're going based on these kinds of scientific, uh, vaguely scientific uh, ideas of theirs. So you had the fascists and the communists. And so he concluded, not wholly unreasonably, but wrong. He concluded, gosh, anybody who claims to have the truth is dangerous. Anyone who, who ha claims to have the truth is only a step away from being a, di a dictator because he's going to force his truth on you. He's going to try to tell you how to live. That's what the World Economic Forum is. They're the mod People want to say that they're Marxists. They're not fa Marxists. They're fascists. They're using Marxist tactics, but they're fascists, and they're determined to impose it on the rest of us. As I say, like the... HOA, the Home Owners Association, from hell. That's what they want to do. That's what they're about. So Popper said, these are the Soviet Union, 
on the one hand and uh, Nazi Germany on the other. He said these kinds of these kinds of uh, societies are closed societies. They're not open to other ideas. They're not open to other perspectives. Diversity is something they absolutely don't want. And he says, so the future for civilization, if there's to be a future for civilization in the atomic era uh, where it's possible to destroy whole countries, perhaps even the entire planet, make it unlivable for all of us, the future is found in a permanent uncertainty about who has the truth. We must always be suspicious of truth claims. I would agree with him on that point. We must. We must validate them. But, he said, for liberal democracies to sustain themselves, we must create the open society. The open society. What is the open society? It is a society in which there are no absolutes. There's a permanent uncertainty about the truth. It's, it's the, the embodiment, the, the creation of a state on pragmatism, on what works. So he wrote two volumes about this, arguably two of the most influential books, The Open Society and Its Enemies of the 20th Century. Karl Popper is one of the most important figures of the 20th century in terms of Western thought. And it is driving what we're seeing here. Here's George Soros sitting in his class, gobbling all this stuff up. But I would say that if Popper were alive, he would look at Soros and he would say, this was not what I had in mind. This is not at all what I've had in mind. In fact, you've perverted what I believed. Popper wasn't an agent of chaos. He wasn't the joker. He wasn't the, but he, but he did unintentionally become the tutor of the Joker. It's interesting to look throughout history and to see how great teachers have often produced some very wicked students. Seneca, the Stoic philosopher, had Nero. Jesus even had Judas, and Karl Popper had George Soros. Now, how does that affect George Soros? How does that relate to what we're talking about when it comes to George Soros? Do you know what the name of George Soros' foundation is? A foundation with $20 billion in funding that it uses to create chaos throughout the Western world and on our borders. It's called the Open Society Foundation. There's no... There's no mistake in this. This isn't accidental. It's his way of kind of um, honoring his old master. It's his way of saying, I am, am putting feet, hands and feet, to the philosophy of my great teacher, Karl Popper. But he's going about it in all the wrong ways. Have you ever seen the um, Hitchcock movie, Rope? It's interesting because I'm sure that the uh, the film is kind of loosely based on Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, or perhaps even the Brothers Karamazov, where someone says, you know, if there is no immortality, there can be no virtue and all things are permissible. And someone sitting in the room who's not very bright leans forward and says, could you explain that again? Could you say that again? Well, I was just basically saying that if there is no God, there's no right and wrong and you get away with anything. And he goes, thank you. I'll remember that. <laughs> and there, shortly thereafter, there's a murder that takes place. And it's someone who is acting on that philosophy. Well, in, uh, in Rope, Jimmy Stewart plays a professor of, I think, criminology or something like this. And I think the movie takes place in, let's say, New York or Chicago. And he's a little full of himself and... I mean, honestly, I think Jimmy Stewart's character, who is supposed to be the protagonist of the movie, is actually one of the villains. And it's because any good teacher knows that young people are ready to put hands and feet to bad ideas. So you have to be careful about the things that you say to them. I say this to somebody with you know, 30 years experience teaching youth, high school and college age. 
They're ready to act on it. So he floats in class the idea of committing the perfect murder. Could it be? Is it possible to commit the perfect murder? And a couple of students in his class, George Soros-like types, who are themselves, uh, shall we say, um, sociopaths, psychopaths, they decide, you know what? Let's impress our teacher and do it. Let's show them that we can commit the perfect murder. And they act on his philosophy. And when he discovers what they've done, he is absolutely horrified. He's absolutely horrified. He's thinking, what, what has happened? Didn't you understand that this is a course in criminology? We're about the prevention of crime, not creating it, not doing it. We're not about, we're just, we're just theorizing. We're just thinking out loud about the possibilities. We don't want to actually go and murder people, but that's exactly what they do. George Soros is that guy. He's, he's, he is the students to Karl Popper's Jimmy Stewart in Rope. As Western civilization burns, George Soros is the guy who is warming his hands in the embers, in the flames that he himself has created. He's the arsonist of Western civilization. That is who he is. He's enjoying what's happening here. And again, he has 20 billion in the Open Society Foundation to do it. Now, Karl Popper, what was it that Karl Popper believed? Karl Popper believed, again, that the way the way to sustain freedom and democracy in the West was that you had to open closed societies. And how do you do that? You have to expose them to other ways of thinking. Immigration is a tool for doing that. It is a tool for doing that. You must open them up to the rest of the world so that they can be influenced by other ideas elsewhere. You have to prevent, you know, absolute control of the media of guys like, uh, you know, Joseph Goebbels and Hitler and their propaganda machine and keeping the society closed, keeping everyone under their thumb and under their influence so that they didn't really know what was going on in the rest of the world. Same in the Soviet Union or any other communist or socialist state you care to name. You have to open closed societies. So far, there's a kind of logic in what Popper was arguing here. Soros has discovered that mass immigration is not just a way to open those societies, it is a way to disrupt them. It is a way to annihilate existing social paradigms so that you can create new ones on top of it. And Christianity is the chief target. Again, I go back to Steve Croft's interview, 60 Minutes interview with George Soros, where Croft, and I'm so thankful that Croft asked him the question, do you believe in God? No. No, says Soros. And I don't really care what the outcome is of my own actions. I just don't care. This is the philosophy that is driving this. Some of you have asked me on social media and elsewhere, emails and that sort of thing, lectures, but why would they do this? Why would they do this? Okay, so they bring about a measure of societal disruption. Do they really want to destroy our cities? I mean, look at San Francisco. Mayor Adams, the mayor of New York City, has been complaining. By the way, Mayor Adams, you're getting exactly what your party is all about. You have no right to complain about mass immigration into your city. You're a part of that. That's, that's you, man. That's on you. That's your city. That's your party. That's the philosophy, man, that you have bought into. And now you are reaping the whirlwind. I hope Governor Abbott of Texas sends them a million more. I hope he sends them to every blue state in the country because this is what you're about. This is what you people have brought upon yourselves. So 
does the radical left, does the global left, the Democrats, do they really want to trash can all of our cities? Yes, unless they live in them. Nancy Pelosi doesn't care about inner, inner city San Francisco. She doesn't live there. She doesn't live there. You see videos of her with Andrea Bocelli in, in Italy. You see her, you know, uh, uh, being toasted and whining and dining all over the world. She doesn't care what's happening there. She only cares about power. And this is the purpose of this. This is all about the disruption of existing social norms, the destruction of existing social norms and existing morality to burn it all to the ground in order to create something new in its place. And this is what I mean, that these are Marxist tactics. Marxists have done this for um, you know a century now. And it is being driven by fascists. Fascists are using these Marxist tactics in order to achieve power. They want complete power. They don't care anything about democracy. They don't care anything about the Declaration of Independence or the, uh, uh, the Constitution. They don't care about the rule of law. They care only about power. And that is because they are ideologues. Ideologues, as I've explained on this show are individuals who believe that their ideas are more important than people. It's why they're so cavalier about terrorism. Western Europe, you know, I've been, I don't know if I've said this on the show before, but I've been to many of the major terrorist sites in Europe, Charlie Hebdo, the Bataclan, the Bataclan was a concert hall where I forget what the name of them, like Eagles of Heavy Metal Death or something like that. Some heavy metal, American heavy metal band was singing when these Muslim terrorists came in with AK-47s, pistols, grenades, you name it. They chained the doors locked and then they got up in the balcony and just began shooting people. It was mass slaughter. People couldn't get out. I forget how many were killed, north of 100 the hyper cachet um, kosher supermarket in Paris, been there. Stockholm, where a guy took a truck and drove over a lot of people. Westminster Bridge, same thing, knife attack. London Bridge, been there to all of those. Nigeria, where Boko Haram and Fulani Herzman militia, both Islamic terrorist groups. Were all of these terrorist attacks perpetrated by Muslims against Western societies, where they all took place, and the response of the French government, of the British government, of the Swedish government, Madrid train bombing, been there too, Spanish government, and of the European Union was cavalier. It was to give, it was to give, you know, words of, you know, we we condemn this. Je suis, you know, Charlie, you know, or whatever it was, they walked um, arm in arm through Paris, you know, proclaiming their support for Charlie Hebdo and for freedom and this kind of stuff. But they kept saying this over and over again. It's not Islam. Islam is a Islam is a religion of peace. It's a religion of peace. Muslims would never really do this. This isn't about this isn't about Islam. Oh, but it is. It absolutely is, as I have explained in previous episodes of this show. But here we're focusing not on Islam. We're focusing on the secularist ideas at the highest level, the open society, the George Soroses, the godless people who are driving this. Why did they have a cavalier attitude to this? Why didn't they say, whew, we need to close the borders and not let any more of these Muslim immigrants in? Because they believe that the open society, for it to be created, they're of the view that in order to make an omelet, you have to crack a few eggs. They believe that terrorism 
is something that simply must be endured in order to create the open society. Because they're of the view that eventually their globalist values, and honestly, apart, apart from belief in God, you can have no values. Secularism, secularism can give no direction, it can give no hope, it can give no values. It is simply the absence of belief in the transcendent is the absence of belief in God. That's all secularism is. So when I hear atheists say they hold to secular ideals, what is that? What are those? There's no such thing. They're just invented. They have, they have no foundation in anything transcendent, in anything eternal, which is to say they're meaningless. You just invent them. But see, they believe the open society types, the global left, globalists, they believe that eventually they will win out over people like this. That their worldview, their globalist kumbaya worldview will win out and that they will eventually conquer these people. Because the open society is a, it's, it's kind of a weird melting pot you open society and then you flood all of every society together with all of its different ideas so that eventually there's no longer any, any uh, pockets of ideas. There's just simply one. You no longer have thesis and antithesis. You just have synthesis to use an old um, paradigm. That's what they believe, and that's what they're trying to create. They think that Muslims will eventually, who move into the West, you know, they're going to want to have Netflix. They're going to want to order, you know, stuff on, uh, on Amazon, and the kids are going to want a Nintendo. They're finding this just simply isn't true. In many instances, indeed, I would say most, they are not assimilating at all. Look at Dearborn, Michigan. Are Muslims assimilating there? Are Muslims big believers in the open society? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And neither should you, by the way. In this, I would agree with Muslims. I just don't agree with the kind of society that they would seek to create. Some years ago, I think I can say this now, we're, we're many years um, after the fact, and uh, he has since left office. I got a call on Easter Sunday and much to my surprise, it was the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions. And he, I had written an article about this, and I can't remember who I wrote it for, uh, American Spectator, USA Today, Fox News, I, I, I don't remember. Uh, I've probably written more than one on this particular topic. And um, he called and he said, you know, I'm perusing your website, and I've just read this article on the philosophy that is driving Democrats and their open border policy. This fascinates me. Can you, do you have time for me to ask you a few questions about it, for you to explain it to me? I was grateful. First of all, I have a very high regard for Jeff Sessions. I think one of the silliest things that Trump ever did was to make war on him. I think he was our best man in the Senate and it was his, it was his platform that Trump essentially adopted as his own. Uh, I get it that he was upset that uh, Sessions had recused himself in the impeachment trial. On the other hand, forgiveness is a real thing and Trump isn't a forgiving man and that I see as a major flaw. So I have huge respect for Jeff Sessions. And uh, I was grateful for that call, and I hope I was able to offer him some insight. But I was explaining to him the very things that we're talking about here. But I also make this caveat, and this is important. You need to understand that very frequently, this is changing, but very frequently the immigrants that we're seeing coming in to the United States are very different from those that are flooding Europe. Now, the Biden administration is trying to change this. But I would say our immigrants, as a rule, historically, have been vastly superior to those that Europe is suffering. 
And that is because in Europe, they're primarily coming out of Islamic states. They're bringing Islam. They're bringing the, the violence, the anti-democratic, uh, anti-woman, the misogyny, the hate of Islam with them into the West. And we're seeing how that's playing out. The open border philosophy, the attempt to create the open society in Europe, how that's playing out. It isn't working. It isn't working at all. Immigrants to the United States are typically coming from Central and South America, from generally Catholic countries. They, for the most part, are people who are seeking the American dream. They are individuals who believe in the family. They believe in hard work. Most of the employers, to make reference to the employer that I was talking about earlier, who said he would be out of business if it were not for immigrants, he was referring to his Hispanic laborers. And he'd say, white kids can't keep up with them. And that I have heard again and again. They, generally speaking, have had a very favorable left a very favorable impression on their American employers. They're individuals who will achieve the American dream. Some of them already have and are. Some of them are on their way because they take very seriously um, hard work and they are seizing upon the opportunities in this country. The same, I might also say, can be said for those people who have come out of um, Asian contexts, for instance, China, Vietnam. Those are people who have seized the, um, the American dream with both hands. They want to achieve it. Those are the kind of immigrants we want. I am not arguing here for zero immigration. That's not my view. We need immigrants. And we want those immigrants who share our values, but they must share our values. And it's interesting to me because I've spent so much time interviewing such people who are seeking to come to the United States throughout South America. I've interviewed them in Colombia, in Peru, Chile, um, Costa Rica, Brazil, numerous other countries, Panama, that are escaping me at the moment. But they are often individuals who are fleeing the very things that Democrats are trying to bring to this country, namely socialism. You bring up that word, they know that word. They know that word in Spanish. They know it in Portuguese. They know, they know what it is, and they don't want it because they've seen it ruin their own countries. A lot of the, uh, the immigrants you see, for instance, in Panama, in Peru, in Colombia, they're people who are coming out of, uh, they're coming out of Venezuela, Brazil as well. They're not just immigrating to the United States. They're fleeing to other South American countries. And uh, those are individuals uh, in many instances, certainly not all, those are people I want to see come to the United States. Those are people that I have great compassion for because they want the same things I want. If I were in their context, I would want it too. There'd be nothing that could keep me from coming to the United States and bringing my family if I were, I were fleeing oppression. America was made of such people, but it's the wide open border policy of Democrats, of the global left, that is bringing destruction. And they know it, and they want it, and they revel in it, and they warm their hands in the flames because they're arrogant enough to believe, first of all, that you can destroy Western values and somehow society will still exist and that you can replace it with something else that somehow you can control this. And very frequently you discover that that just simply is not the case. I want to take a look at, by the way, a little picture I came across. And, and when I came across it in a news item, nobody had commented on it. I just thought it was funny. But you see all of these immigrants flowing from South America across our border. You see them all the time. But you got one guy in the middle who is carrying a mattress over his head. <laughs> what do you think is up with that? He's carrying a mattress. I mean, that's a man with a plan right there. He says, I am, I am not living in America without my Tempur-Pedic. 
<laughs> I am bringing it. I am bringing it with me because I just can't sleep on anything. Either that, or he's a guy who figured, you know, all along the way, I'm going to have to sleep, and I'm not sleeping on the ground. I am bringing a mattress with me. But that is, there's a story behind that. A man is bringing. He doesn't appear to have anything else on him, but he does. He is bringing a mattress. That's impressive. But these are people who are crossing the Rio Grande. They're coming from South America. Don't assume that all of these people are criminals. They most certainly are not. But there are, there's a strong criminal element that is crossing our border. And I would argue there's a strong foreign. By that, I mean, I mean obviously, they're foreigners because they're, they're not Americans. But they're enemies of the United States. The Chinese and the Russians, I believe, are sending, I mean, we have reports of this, are sending people across our border. And those are potential sleeper agents in some future attack on the United States. I want to end with this, and it is the words of Viktor Orban, in which he said that we're going to defend our values. We're going to defend our Christian values because in the absence of them, our society cannot exist. Cannot exist. I believe Christopher Hitchens, whom I referenced earlier, I was very close to convincing Christopher of this. I think he was moving in this direction. I don't think he received Christ, you know, before he died, but I think Christopher was thinking deeply on this. I think he was recognizing that most of what he loved about the United States and cherished in life, that those, those ideas were the offspring of a robust Christianity. So he was trying to, he, he called himself once a Protestant atheist. <laughs> Um, a contradiction in terms, but part of what he meant by that was that he wanted the values of Christianity by still rejecting God. This philosophy is driving George Soros and the globalists. They too believe there is no God. And therefore they can do whatever they want because they don't believe. George Soros, why doesn't he care? about this, as he said in the 60 Minutes interview with Steve Croft, why doesn't he care what the social consequences are of his actions? Because, as he says at the end of the interview, he doesn't believe in God. So he doesn't believe there's anyone to judge him. And he believes his money insulates him from any judgment, from anybody and any government. Therefore, I can burn the whole freaking world to the ground. And that's what I'm aiming to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in Europe, and I'm going to especially do it in America because I hate America. Ladies and gentlemen, the people who are driving the border policy, they are hateful ideologues. They are godless. They are motivated by hate. And they want to destroy it all. And we have to destroy them. Go and find Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister online, and listen to as much of him as you can because the guy, the guy gets it. I know his accent is quite strong, but he understands what's happening here. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. <laughs>